Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to our EduSat network. Our topic of discussion today is soft power in international relations and for this very discussion and lecture we have thus in our studio Dr. Rajan Kumar, Assistant Professor, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Kumar has been teaching for nearly a decade and he is a regular commentator on news channels such as DD Urdu, Lok Sabha TV, Radio French International and of course many more. And also I'd like to share with you that he has written several newspaper articles uh, uh, for uh, of course many newspapers and with this uh, brief introduction I would like to welcome sir to our studio and also request him to begin our today's lecture. Thank you so much sir for coming. Thank you Urvashi and uh, you're very kind. Uh, uh, we have been discussing in the last uh, few lectures about uh, India's foreign policy then we started with the in international politics and various theories and various issues of international politics. And I thought, you know, uh, today is, uh, uh, I, I'll introduce you to a, to a theme which is called soft power in international politics. And you must have heard this concept of soft power. Uh, the soft power, you know, is the way it's understood in international politics and the way it is defined, what are the features of soft power, why people call it soft power when there is already hard power, what are the differences between hard power and soft power, what are the theories on soft power, and what are the, what are the uses of soft power for international politics or uh, in the making of the foreign policy of a state. So I thought, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's important for you as an, as an undergraduate or a postgraduate student uh, to understand the various dimensions of soft power uh, in international politics. Uh, when, uh, when you talk of power, uh, it's, it's important to understand how do you define power. Uh, power can be defined as uh, the ability of an individual or ability of the state uh, to get things done by the other state or for individual get things done by other individual. So your ability to get things done is the basic uh, basic ingredient or basic uh, defining feature, basic core of uh, any power, uh, the way you define power. So uh, similarly, you know, uh, this uh, the power uh, in international politics uh, can be can be di divided into two parts. One is the hard power and the other is, the other is soft power. Uh, the way we understand soft power, it, it is always understood in terms of in comparison with the hard power because you, you need to distinguish the soft power with the hard power. So that contest and the, and, and, and the, the dichotomy or the di distinction between hard power and soft power is important to, to understand. <coughs> and uh, I will start with this uh, concept of hard power first because you need to understand what is hard power, only then you can understand uh, the concept of soft, soft power in international politics. Uh, so uh, I think you know this pretty clear and you must be knowing that the certain basic components of a uh, hard power, uh, hard power of any state can be understood as uh, this uh, military and the defense capability of, of a state. Uh, you know that you know uh, uh, the power of a country, the way we define or the way uh, the scholars of international politics define uh, power in international politics, uh, when they use power, mostly they use in the context of hard power. And when they refer to hard power, they basically refer to some of the basic things or the basic features of uh, this uh, basic features or the, some of the core elements of power. One is military and defense as I, as I told you. So uh, military is very important because you know by military you say that some country is very powerful and the other country is not so powerful. And the second feature is the economic power uh, that uh, in, in, in when, you, in, when you explain or when you say that uh, that, that there is a country, for instance, Japan or Germany, they are powerful than the other states. So you, you, they are powerful because of the economic resources or the economic development that uh, that have taken place in those states. So uh, military and defense is one. Economic power is second. The size of territory that is also important constituent of uh, the power of any country. Uh, if the size of a, a size of a state is very small, <coughs> that state is likely to be not so powerful. Uh, you have a country like Fiji, for instance, you have a country like Guyana, you have a country like Maldives, you have countries like Bhutan, uh, the, which are, which are uh, very small in size. Uh, they are small in size as a, as a result, the resources are very limited, as a result, uh, the, the population is very less. So they cannot play a very powerful role or very influential role in international politics. So size also matters as the population matters. matters. Uh, Apart from all these, you know, uh, one uh, other uh, constituent of soft uh, hard power would be the stability, uh, stability of the government, because you know you need some kind of policy continuity. If if, uh, if the country is not having stable politics, if the country is going through a turmoil, or if the country is passing through a difficult phase of destabilization, so in that case, it's very very difficult for the country to exert power uh, in the international system. So. Uh, 
stability of uh, uh, st political stability is important for the consistency of the policy uh, policy making in uh, of the state so as a result these are the broader features of uh, hard power what we call the the power broadly is used many times just as a power but you know since we are distinguishing uh, between the hard power and the soft power it's important to understand the exclusive elements of hard power and then we'll come back to the concept of soft power and the important elements or the aspects of soft power uh, so militarily if i have to explain you today if i if if, if i need to uh, tell you the hierarchy the way uh, this uh, man, the 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 way the international system is structured in terms of military power so the first uh, important country is uh, the united states as you know that united states is the most important uh, uh, most important country in terms of military power the, uh, in the us is the most america is the most uh, powerful um, country in terms of its military in terms of military spending uh, in terms of the technology that it uses in terms of uh, is uh, the presence of its military in various parts of the world uh, also in terms of the alliances military alliances that it has created uh, in in uh, in uh, in collaboration with the european states uh, in the form of nato so uh, that makes united states the the superpower what we call it superpower uh, in the earlier times soviet union was the superpower and soviet union there is always a contest of in uh, contest between the Soviet Union and United States in terms of uh, balance of power that you know each country was trying to balance the other country but after the decline of the Soviet Union in 1991 uh, this America remained the sole superpower in the international system and uh, if, if uh, you take uh, the military spending uh, as one of the and one of the features of uh, the power of a country so US is spending nearly uh, nearly uh, nearly 650 billion dollars uh, for military and that 650 billion dollar is uh, equal to the military spending of all the countries put together the second country in terms of military spending uh, in today's uh, time uh, is uh, would be china uh, china is spending nearly 130 or i know um, 130 billion dollars uh, uh, in for the military uh, india is spending quite a lot and india is also spending nearly 40 billion dollars now uh, uh, more than 35 billion dollars actually so in terms of uh, its military spending uh, but about our military spending, what is also important is the, the the presence of military that you have in the various parts of the world. And today, America is the only country which has its bases uh, in various parts of the world. It has its base in uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it has its in NATO force is there. It has its base in uh, Japan. There also this uh, in the, the Japanese security is controlled by United States. Uh, it has its base in uh, Indian uh, Indian Ocean. And you might be you might be knowing this. <coughs> This uh, what is known as uh, uh, the island Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia is an island where there is an American base, and uh, India, you know, at uh, sometimes you know India has said that the in, uh, the American base should not be in the Diego Garcia. So, <coughs> the America has a, has its military presence all over the world, and it has uh, it has the capability to strike. Uh, it has its capability to strike uh, any country uh, from uh, because its base its bases are spread all over the world. So, uh, in terms of military, as I told you, U.S. Is, and in terms of economy also, uh, U.S. is the most important country. U.S. is the superpower. Uh, China is number two in terms of military. Then you, you have Russia. Uh, Russia is Russia. The military technology is very very developed in Russia. Uh, Russia is the only country which can counter United States in terms of its. Uh, uh, in terms of military equipments or the nuclear technology that it has. Uh, it's, uh, in terms of technology, it's much ahead of China. And in fact, China and India are the two countries which are importing most of the weapons and the defense uh, system from Russia. And uh, so, uh, th in terms of military spending, China is second, but in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, technology, Russia would be second because the Rus Russian military technology is very, very advanced. Uh, after that, you know, you have countries like India, which is spending quite a lot. But uh, in India, the technology is not indigenous. As you know, that you know, India is the biggest importer of arms uh, in the in the world uh, today. And India is importing from countries like uh, Russia. Russia is the main supplier of uh, arms and weapons uh, to India. And uh, and uh, apart from uh, Russia, there are other countries like uh, now France, Israel, United States has become as the biggest uh, exporter uh, in the last year. So these are the countries which are exporting uh, the weapons or the fighter aircrafts and other tanks and all uh, to India. So uh, India is also very important now, getting important in terms of military power. Then you have countries which are economic powerhouses like you know uh, Germany and Japan. Uh, Germany and Japan, you know, uh, they have this uh, they have this uh, very powerful economy. 
but uh, they do not have independent military uh, since the World War II period. So, and that, that the security is even now controlled by by United States. So, as a result, they have economic power, but they do not have the military power. So, now the important thing to understand that hard power has uh, two important elements. One is the it has the capability to coerce. Uh, if the United States does not, if, if, if the United States, for instance, you know, wants to get things done uh, from another state, uh, uh, even if the other state is not willing, it can actually attack or it, it in intervenes in the policy of the state. And that uh, has that uh, through that, you know, it's a very coercive method of getting things done. The way uh, United, uh, United States did in, in Iraq, the way it did in uh, Afghanistan, the way it is, the kind of role it's playing in Libya, Syria at the moment. So uh, it's a very coercive method of, you know, uh, exerting the, um, the the hard power uh, in, uh, for, uh, by, for getting things done or to uh, to bringing that state, in, bring the policy of that state in favor of its own, uh, in its own policy. Uh, apart from coercion, there is another element through which these uh, these countries they exercise power. The second is uh, through payment. So it's a kind of you know uh, uh, it's a kind of uh, buying the other country, uh, buying buying the other state by making some payment. For instance, you know the Pakistan. In the case of Pakistan, you always uh, know uh, you always hear that uh, United States is paying some aid or grants to uh, to Pakistan, so that you know Pakistani military does not attack. The establishment in uh, Afghanistan, a military American military establishment in Afghanistan, it also pays uh, this uh, pays uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, the Pakistani military also. Uh, it provides technology and the other kind of aids to uh, to Pakistani state and the military, basically so that you know the Pakistani army or the state does not support Taliban. So th these are other methods of you know making the policy of the other state favorable to its own state or favorable to the policy of the state. So. Coercion is one method, as in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, and uh, payment is another met method of uh, aligning the policy of the other state with with the own state. So that's, these are the two methods of uh, uh, used uh, for uh, for uh, aligning the policy of the state by the by the powerful state. Now, and, uh, now, uh, what is the soft power? We understood the soft power and uh, we understood the hard power, but uh, the now we need to, to contrast that with the soft power. The concept of soft power was given by uh, the Howard uh, professor, uh, political scientist Joseph Nye in 1990, and he defined it as the ability of the state to attract and co-opt rather than coerce or use of force or money to achieve power. So in in in, in the hard part, the coercion was uh, was uh, important element. Uh, the uh, the forcing or the coercion uh, or the uh, the paying paying the paying money to get things done so that was the method used in the, for the hard power but here is the ability to attract and co-opt so you basically you know you you have certain features or you have certain elements which are attractive uh, and that becomes persuasive for the other state to follow you so it's not the coercion here uh, in software you do not have the coercion it's, you don't use military or you do not use uh, the the financial power to get things done is the ability to influence the behavior without threat or payment. Uh, many of its components are, are actually, the many of the components of soft power are actually outside the domain of the government. A hard power is controlled by and large by the government, but many of the components of, many of the components of soft power are actually outside the domain of the government. They are not decided, they are not decided by the government, they are not controlled by the government. Uh, it shapes the uh, social envi environment for policy and it has uh, enabling and disabling effect, so it will, uh, you know, uh, it will persuade the state uh, to follow certain uh, certain norms or certain values, certain rules, uh, and it also, you know, it will uh, deter the state from uh, from having a policy which is aggressive or following uh, or having a policy which is which goes against the basic uh, value of the uh, the other state. So uh, it has enabling and disabling effect. Uh, so the here the difference between the hard part and the soft part is that. Hard, hard power is all about coercion, hard power is all about you know, uh, pressurizing the other state to get things done. Uh, soft power here would be uh, something you know, which become, there are certain elements which become attractive to the other state. So and that is the basic difference between the hard power and the soft power. And uh, in uh, 2003, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Nye uh, uh, gave a new concept called a smart power. So it's not just it's not just the hard power. It's not the soft power. What a state needs in in the making of its foreign policy or in the making of its policy towards other state, what the state needs, according to uh, according to uh, Joseph Nye, is the smart power. 
smart power is basically the the it, uh, basically the combination or the aggregation of a hard power as well as the software so it has the elements of coercion and payment but it also has an uh, element of attraction so what what uh, smart power tells you that you know your hard power is not enough uh, you have to have the 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 software but your software is also not enough because in the in the absence of in the absence of hard power soft power would be taken as a sign of weakness so then uh, with this he gave this concept of uh, uh, what what is known uh, uh, in the in the literature of international politics as the soft uh, smart power uh, soft power is uh, uh, more effective than coercion uh, that's the argument given by joseph nye and values like democ democracy uh, human rights individual rights and uh, they are much more seductive uh, than the than the uh, than the imposition of democracy by the by the powerful state uh, what it tells you that you know uh, there are certain uh, features of like uh, certain features like certain features which can be attractive to the other state and other states follow not because of any pressure not because of the external persuasion or pressure because the other state feels that you know these are the value which are uh, good for their own state so it becomes very attractive and seductive for the states like the values of democracy the value of individual rights the values of uh, values of human rights uh, uh, these are the these are the some of the elements which are very attractive to other states uh, software is not uh, software is not uh, an, uh, is it's not it's not about idealism or it's not about liberalism it is simply the form of power for getting the outcome so uh, also please understand that uh, when the realists define that uh, the international politics or international system is all about the struggle of power so uh, the person you know when you when you talk of uh, the soft power soft power is not about the you know the liberalism or idealism it's actually the component of hard power that's the that's the way uh, joseph nye has, has defined it so that is component of the of, of power and power understood differently by uh, in terms of you know some in terms of uh, some tangent or some, uh, the 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 uh, in terms of normative structure that is there in the international system or the normative values which are which become attractive to the other state uh, soft power is descriptive rather than normative concept uh, soft power can be used uh, uh, also please understand that it's not the soft power is uh, is a harmless kind of concept uh, soft power can be used for nefarious purposes uh, for instance you know all the all the dicta dictators like hitler stalin or mao they all possess soft power Uh, the 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 state during that period they also promoted software and they also possessed software uh, it was it is not higher than the than the hard power or it's not you cannot say that software is better than the other power it only tells you that you know there are certain cultural uh, or the or the value system or there are certain policies which are adopted by willingness you know the the voluntarily the states voluntarily adopt those features because they find that you know these values are, are useful for their own state so that is the beauty that is the seductive part of the 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 software or the values of the software now uh, what are the because you know a software concept emerged uh, in the context of united states uh, where joseph nye uh, was uh, joseph nye concept basically you know it uh, tried to explain the software of united states and he argued that how uh, the american software was declining and uh, you know when he is giving the theory in uh, 1990 many of the people argued Uh, many of the people argued that you know american soft america was in decline so uh, but he argued that you know american uh, american soft power uh, uh, is is in decline that's for, is in decline but the american the, the american power as a whole uh, continued to dominate the world system not just because of the hard power but also because of the soft power that it has uh, the for instance you know the american system of democracy the the freedom and the rule of law which is promoted by america which is uh, followed by america and it is also followed by the other state the republican or the democratic form of the government which is there in us and which is followed by the states and its openness to immigrants of all races and regions so uh, it is open to uh, american system although you know uh, this is the argument given by joseph nye but it's not open to all the immigrants of all the races it has the visa regime which is quite restrictive but uh, still you know since it allows many of the migrants to come and settle down there so that again is one of the attractions of united states and many of the indians also for instance you know uh, there are nearly 3 million indians who live there so they find uh, that the state to be uh, to very attractive in terms of employment in terms of the the culture that it has so that is the seductive part of the soft power that is the reason why people would like to go and settle in that state and that is the uniqueness of america 
uh, which is more like a, in terms of Sasi Tharoor as he tells it, it's more like a melting pot uh, that you know where people from all the cultures and all the uh, all the, all all the nationalities they come and live together, they melt together and they become the part of uh, this American exceptionalism, they're part of American culture, and they share the dream of what is known as the American dream to to rise with the comp with the hard work and competition. And uh, um, the the fact that you know America is the most important country in today's uh, international system that is also very attractive uh, to uh, to other states. So and as a result, you know the other states and the people of other states they find America very attractive. So these are some of the features of American uh, uniqueness or American exceptional ex exceptionalism. But uh, that the 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 idea of ex exceptionalism or the broader parameter of ex exceptionalism can be used for any state. Every state is unique in uh, one way or the other. So uh, it's nothing about you know, the particular, the very, uh, there's, there's nothing exceptional about American exceptionalism. Every state ha is uh, exceptional in one way or the other. Every state has certain cultures or certain features which are different from the other state. So that the, the idea of exceptionalism can, can be applied to, uh, to other states as well. Now what are the examples of this American soft power? Uh, Boeing and Intel, for instance, you know, they're all American. Uh, all the all the flights that you see, most of the most of the the flights, in the Boeing, GE, and and most of the computers, they're the the manufacturing initially in the initial years it was done by the Intel. Then uh, if you talk of McDonald and KFC, the in the eating joints, they are American, and now they are there uh, in every part of the world, every most every important city of the world. Then you have the Apple iPad phone, which is very popular throughout the world. And you have MTV and the Hollywood movies. Uh, the Hollywood movie is popular throughout the world. Whether you go to Russia, whether you go to uh, even the even the places where uh, uh, where you know the Hollywood is not liked, even in the places where people are extremely critical of Hollywood movies because of the violence, excessive violence, because of the excessive sex, even in those states, uh, the the soft power, uh, this uh, uh, the American Hollywood movies are very popular. In fact, it is said that just before the 9/11. Uh, attack the the attackers or the militants. They actually uh, they actually had the food in McDonald's. They had burgers there, and then they went for this uh, uh, this attack of uh, this hijacking the plane and then uh, going to the attack. Uh, so uh, uh, then the, you have the CNN and the Voice of America. Uh, Voice of America is the radio news uh, broadcast uh, tele broadcast by the American uh, American state. Uh, then you have the CNN, which is uh, CNN, the Fox News, and the other news channels, uh, which are the American uh, news channels, which are popular throughout the world, because they have the resources, they have the uh, the international reach, and they they have the satellite uh, satellites through which they can telecast these programs. So CNN is very popular throughout the world, and as a result, you know they they decide the agenda of the news, they decide control the content of the news. So through that, you know uh, even. Uh, CNN is not controlled by the state, but CNN follows some of the basic premises of the state. So the basic, uh, uh, the broader, um, uh, broader framework is again, uh, it, it follows the some of the some of the some of the uh, some of the agendas of the state. So uh, software emerges uh, as as the, these examples tell you. The Boeing, Intel, all these are private companies, including CNN uh, is a private company. So the software emerges without government. So they have. Uh, they have established the broader, uh, the, um, they established the huge soft power for the American state uh, in other parts of the world. So, and they are not, uh, con they are not done by the state uh, deliberately or directly, but you know, uh, they, they, they indirectly play a role in uh, creating the image of America uh, in the other parts of the world. And uh, but at times, you know, the state also promotes uh, soft power. Uh, for instance, you know, even the state of America, they'll. Have the scholarships uh, for uh, um, for the foreign citizens or the students of the other countries. For instance, you have the Fulbright scholarship. Uh, they have the cultural exchange program of with various universities, where they promote the exchange of ideas, exchange of scholars from one country to their own country. So these are also the, there are some some of the elements of soft power are uh, state controlled, but some of the some of the elements of uh, state power, some of the elements of soft power are also controlled. And are, are actually the, and they are done not controlled by the state. They are op, they are operational because of the other players, which are non-state players. Whether it can be NGOs, it, it can be M, uh, multinational companies, uh, or it can be uh, some of the private companies uh, like news channels and the Hollywood movies. Now, uh, is because you know we live in India. It's also important to understand 
what are the what are the elements of soft power uh, for for India, uh, and uh, uh, and we should not be narrow in defining the soft power here. And in th the broader inclusive, if you see the soft power of India, traditionally and historically, India had and India had a very huge uh, the the capital of soft power. Uh, India, uh, starting from the historical period, if I take you, the Indian civilization, the way it has spread in various parts of the world, so that that is again uh, uh, the that is again the one of the elements of soft power. When Buddhism started traveling from India to other parts of the world, and I'm talking the the period of Ashoka, when he started uh, sending you know the Buddhist monks, uh, his sent his daughter and uh, the other people to various parts of Sri Lanka, uh, to uh, to south southern part of India. Uh, to Tibet and to and then it traveled later to Southeast Asian states also. So Buddhism started traveling uh, to other parts of the uh, other parts of the world, and uh, later on it went to China. It went up till Japan. So uh, uh, so uh, the Buddhism was Buddhism. You know Buddhism as a religion or Buddhism as a uh, as a philosophy. It didn't. Uh, it was not because of the st uh, state power. It didn't go to Sri Lanka or other parts of the because of the state power. Uh, the Buddhist monks were not a powerful people. They were not like military, military uh, crusaders who were trying to convert people. Uh, basically, they were trying to promote some of the uh, ideas of Buddhism. Uh, they were trying to promote the the basic philosophy of Buddhism, and which was attractive to other people because they found uh, some kind of you know, uh, they find uh, they found this uh, religion to be very rational. They found this religion to be very attractive. As a result, you know, uh, the many of the the people which were either pagan or the tribal people. Uh, in Sri Lanka or Southeast Asia or the China or Tibet, so they converted to Buddhism. They liked the philosophy of Buddhism. So the actual the soft power in India, uh, if I see that started from the Buddhist period, and uh, after that, uh, after that, you know, uh, the uh, if I start from that historical period uh, to if I come to the uh, to the period of Gandhi, so the elements that we have learned from that soft power, like you know, the the, the notion of tolerance. The non-violence and the struggle against injustice. So these are the, some of the basic things you know which were promoted uh, right from Buddhist period uh, till uh, till till the uh, till till Gandhi's time. So uh, the tolerance, non-violence that became that became that came to be associated with Buddhism, uh, Gandhi, and that also became an integral part of India. So as a result, when you go and travel outside, so you'll find that you know India is identified with a culture of tolerance, a culture of non-violence, a culture. In, uh, Indians are supposed to be very uh, spiritual. Uh, the, many of the people, you know, very. Uh, ironically, believe that Indians will not be fighting because they are non-violent people. They believe that uh, if you go outside and if you travel to one of the countries in Europe, they believe that many, most of the Indians will be doing. Uh, since they are very spiritual, most of the Indians will be practicing yoga. Uh, so these are some of the the way the image of India is there. The way you know we uh, uh, the way uh, India is understood. India as a culture, as a nation, the way is there in the imagination of people in other parts of the world. So uh, these, are, so that is the historical part of this, the Indian soft power. But uh, during the during the colonial struggle, uh, as you know, that uh, Gandhi was uh, Gandhi was the the most important leader of uh, uh, of the anti-colonial movement. So Gandhi promoted this idea of uh, the mobilization of people through non-violent methods. So basically, he was trying to uh, trying to fight against the Britishers. Britishers were the hard power, and uh, Gandhi was using uh, the soft power of. Uh, Mobilizing people through non-violence, mobilizing uh, people on the on the concept of satyagraha, satyagraha. So you know uh, through that you know there, there a, you can see the clear contest between the hard power and the soft power. The British were very repressive. British were using the military methods to control uh, any kind of mobilization or any kind of protest by Gandhi and his people. So and Gandhi was using the soft power. The Gandhi was uh, promoting the idea of mobilizing the people uh, against a, a very powerful military. Uh, military state against the very powerful military force uh, through the soft power, soft power of uh, non-violence, uh, soft power of satyagraha, uh, soft, power, uh, soft power of Gandhi. Uh, so uh, these were the elements of Gandhi's soft power. So that is how you see that you know the way the Indian soft power is emerging, and uh, and understand that this soft power, the struggle of Gandhi, Gandhi's struggle against colonialism, that has a huge huge impact throughout the world, especially in the colonial uh, countries. Where you know uh, whether I talk of Nkrumah in uh, in Ghana and many other parts of the South Africa and in other parts of the world in Yugoslavia and other parts, they adopted this non-violent method of protest, and 
in Southeast Asian states, uh, Southeast Asian states also. So where Gandhi's idea of mobilization uh, through non-violent method, that was the soft power that was adopted, that was adopted by many of the other states uh, against their uh, colonial rulers. So uh, what we see is that you know the India India, India was very rich in terms of uh, the 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 element and the component or, or the or the or the what we call uh, soft power in, in in international politics india in fact in the colonial period or the after the struggle of the colonial period india was one of the champions of soft power and that soft power india was accepted as yeah, one of the leaders of you know one of the more uh, one of the leaders who uh, uh, in the country which propounded some uh, ethics and morality in international politics uh, it stood for you know the non militarization of the state it also uh, in the initial years it also uh, asked other uh, other states the, uh, the nuclear states to denuclearize uh, to uh, non proliferation it supported uh, non -prolif uh, the idea of non proliferation and non testing of the nuclear weapons although it was not accepted by most of the states but the fact that you know uh, india assumed the leadership of the third world countries so that was uh, that was also the uh, the soft that was uh, contributed or that happened because of the soft power of India where India was accepted as the leader of the third world countries. So that is how you understand the, the, the importance of soft power in, in uh, uh, soft power in international politics. Uh, uh, Indian democracy, the fact that you know uh, that India remained democracy while most of the post colonial states whether it is the African states or even countries like Pakistan or Indonesia. So those who, the countries which emerged from the colonies, they uh, very soon they became the dict dictatorial states. They could not remain democracy. Uh, but India very strangely or ironically, uh, though it was predicted by many of the philosophers that India will not remain, uh, 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 India will not survive as a nation or India will not remain democratic, India remained uh, a, a democracy. And that's the beauty of this Indian soft power, or uh, that the notion that you know India, India is a democracy, uh, despite all the all the weaknesses, despite all the uh, all the all the you know, poverty or the unemployment or the other social problems that we have it here. India remained plural, India remained secular, and India remained democratic. So that is the soft soft uh, soft ingredients of India's power. So that is that is th th these are the uh, these are the components of uh, India's soft power. So diversity, diversity uh, pluralism, uh, uh, autonomy, these are some of the features, political features of uh, India's soft power. Now coming to the, the, to the non-political features of soft power, so one is uh, the yoga. Uh, yoga is very popular throughout the world, yoga is equated with India and as I told you that if you travel to, to one of the European states, they would be thinking uh, the moment they see India, uh, they, the kind of image that they have that uh, one number one that Indian would be very spiritual. Second, they might be thinking that you know, uh, Indian uh, as an Indian you must be uh, practicing yoga. And the third, they'll think that you might be a software engineer. Uh, software that also soft comes, but although it, it does not include, it does not come into the software. But uh, and, and the notion that India has, the image that an Indian carries, because you know you uh, an, when in, when an Indian travels to other part of other parts of the world, the image that it carries is that uh, of uh, a software engineer or uh, this uh, the, the yoga teacher or very spiritual so uh, or very religious sometimes people think that you know the, uh, the Indians are very religious also so th that is the kind of image that India has uh, 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 about uh, or India has and the, when Indian in, or when Indians travel they also carry that image with them so yoga is again very popular and yoga now uh, and yoga now is uh, uh, popular in the Western countries, and they, they realize that yoga yoga is very uh, important for the unity of thought and mind, or unity of body and the mind. So for that, you know, yoga is practiced by many of the European people also now. And there are various forms of yoga, and now some of the forms of yoga are so distinct that you know it's very difficult to actually identify with the the traditional yoga uh, traditional yoga that you have. And there are, some, there are certain well, India is the only country where you have university for yoga. Uh, in Bihar, there is a place called Munger where there is university for yoga. And very recently, the uh, the Modi uh, Modi government and Modi government uh, uh, elected one uh, one minister uh, who would be uh, yoga minister. Uh, so that is the way India is promoting this uh, soft power or India is promoting the notion of yoga. When the Prime Minister Modi gave the speech in the General Assembly. Uh, and during his September visit to United States. So he said that he requested the other states to uh, celebrate one day as the yoga day 
and um, uh, and that actually mater materialized and now uh, i think it's 21st june uh, uh, one of the one of the days uh, uh, is celebrated as the yoga day uh, by the united nations and throughout the world and and, and next which is very important for uh, for uh, this uh, uh, so for indian soft power that is the bollywood uh, you probably won't imagine the impact the bollywood has in uh, in throughout the world uh, now bollywood uh, bollywood is not just popular among the diaspora or diaspora indian diaspora who are living in united states united kingdom australia or other parts of the world indian films indian movies indian songs uh, they are very popular in many parts of the world uh, and uh, they are popular also among the non diasporic population in those uh, countries uh, uh, in fact if you travel to turkey countries like turkey syria uh, egypt uh, so uh, these indian actors for instance shahrukh khan amitabh bachchan uh, they are uh, salman khan they are very popular and since you know indian films or indian soap operas they promote a uh, family value they promote the value of marriage they they promote the value of loyalty and commitment to your uh, to your family uh, to your wife so they are uh, very much liked by the by the people in these countries especially the, in the islamic states uh, um, of uh, iraq uh, syria uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and these kind of this uh, this uh, this collective value system is very uh, uh, is is liked by these people. So uh, the actors, you know, the actors are very popular in these states, and Bollywood is having a huge business uh, outside uh, uh, outside uh, in in the in the in the other countries. So Bollywood is again has become one of the important constituents of India soft power. Then uh, in the soft power, you also have the cuisine and the uh, the Indian food, for instance, you know. Uh, and Indian cuisine, and then uh, and like you know the chicken curry. So uh, the uh, the curry, the curry, the concept of curry is identified with, with Indian. Uh, there is uh, it is said that you know the chicken tikka curry actually, you know the chicken tikka curry is uh, uh, the, the when one of the restaurants in in the UK uh, they used to serve chicken tikka. But you know when one white went to that restaurant, he asked he asked that. Uh, he wanted to have the curry because you know he, he he always thought of India with the curry, so uh, he said that you know in the chicken tikka cannot be curry, but what he did is that you know he put some sauce in that and that became chicken curry. So uh, uh, some of the uh, you know I have heard I don't know the the real origin of that, but uh, Sasi Tharoor has quoted and many the other people have quoted that uh, the chicken tikka masala actually originated in Britain, but it has this Indian connotation or Indian origin. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that many of the Indian foods are. Are uh, very popular uh, in other parts of the world, and the curry, the concept of curry is uh, curry and various spices and various kind of foods. Uh, they are now, uh, uh, they are now. If you even if you go to smaller countries like Estonia, Finland, and other places, they are there. There are a number of Indian restaurants which are uh, carrying the Indian uh, Indian cuisine in other parts of the world. So that is again one of the elements of uh, India's soft power. Uh, then, then you have the culture. And the culture, you know, the 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 whether it's the Hindu culture or the Buddhist culture or the the composite culture which India has, the secular culture that it has. So uh, those are also the elements of uh, India soft power. And now you have the agency of ICSSR, uh, uh, I, uh, Indian Council of Cultural ICCR, uh, which promotes uh, the uh, the Indian culture in the other parts of the world. So uh, these are some of the elements of India's. Uh, soft power in international politics, uh, and the diversity and the composite culture have we, that we have that is again very interesting to other people in the world. There was a time just uh, before this, uh, the BJP government. There was a time when the prime minister was a Sikh, uh, uh, the president was a Muslim, uh, uh, prime minister uh, this uh, uh, Manmohan Singh was a Sikh, the president uh, Abdul Kalam was a Muslim, and the leader of the, uh, the ruling party, leader of the ruling party wa was Sonia Gandhi, who was a Catholic Christian in a country which is uh, uh, um, where the majority of the people are Hindu. So that is the beauty and that is the diversity of India, uh, and that diversity is very attractive to other people in the world. So the kind of composite culture that has emerged in India, the kind of secular composite culture that has emerged in India, <coughs> so that is again. And uh, an important element that is very seductive to many of the parts uh, of the world. The, the, despite the ethnic and linguistic uh, divisions and the religious, uh, religious diversity that we have, the fact that India has survived as a successful uh, country, so that is the soft power and that is very seductive and attractive to the people uh, throughout the world. Uh, Nehru also promoted a non-alignment movement, uh, which uh, can be taken as the uh, some of the elements can be taken as soft power. The concept of 
punch shield. For instance, uh, that uh, that could be taken as an element of sort power. Then anti-colonial solidarity, so that which was established by Nehru. So all of that established India's soft power in the uh, during the Nehru period, and that uh, promoted the role and the image of India uh, in the other parts of the world. Uh, India's cricket diplomacy, then the um, Vajpayee's uh, Lahore bus diplomacy, then the uh, Prime Minister Modi's. Uh, uh, linking with the diaspora, then the neighborhood uh, first policy, uh, these are some of the broader elements of uh, India's soft power. So, uh, so the soft power varies from you know the political culture to, uh, to, the, to the real culture and to the, uh, to the even the food culture which can be biryani or the chicken curry. So these are some of the elements of India's. So religious tolerance uh, and uh, uh, religious tolerance is again uh, one of the important aspects of uh, India's soft power. And uh, the fact that you know now some of the, uh, the unfortunate thing is that some of the uh, some of the minority institutions are attacked by uh, by 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 the fringes uh, of, uh, of, of of a particular culture. So that is a kind of kind of damaging the soft power of India uh, in Islamic world. That is also damaging the soft power of India in the in the Christian world. Now, uh, now, what is, what are the important elements of uh, the Prime Minister Modi's soft power? One is the connecting with the diaspora, especially the persons of Indian origin. Then he also talks of you know the promotion of democracy and all, and the, he, he talks of history and culture. So the historical aspect and the cultural aspect, so they are also the important uh, part of India's uh, India's soft power. Then he, he promoted yoga. As I told you that he appointed a minister, and June 21 is now celebrated as the International Day of Yoga. And, and so these are the things which are being promoted by the Modi's government to uh, soft power. Now briefly I'll also tell you that you know every country promotes a soft power and every country uh, has a certain you know seductive or attractive element. So yes, similarly in the case of China, uh, Chinese culture is now like um, is, uh, is having its impact in various parts of the world. In Southeast Asia it has an impact, it, it has impact in East Asia, it, ha it also has impact now in Africa. So uh, China is also very strongly promoting soft power in other parts of the world. Uh, is at, uh, from Confucianism to egalitarian communism. So China is, uh, China is promoting uh, that kind of uh, uh, soft power. We have institutes which are uh, Confucian institutes which are established in various parts of the world. So they, these are the elements of uh, Chinese soft power. Uh, Buddhism, I know, uh, now uh, coming back to in the uh, Buddhism uh, uh, as a soft power of India, so it, it was the first rational and reformist uh, religion and which was non-violent religion. So that is that was the first expression of ex, and that was the first expansion of the culture and civilization. And then, then uh, this, this was very tolerant, it, it was the middle path and it, it uh, the concept of enlightenment. And they were the very attractive. Nalanda University was formed much before uh, there was any university in the in the world, in the in the in the Europe, in, in Europe. So that was uh, the kind of uh, uh, the soft power that we had in the ancient times, Ashoka's so Dhamma, that was uh, the soft power that India had. Buddhist people in Southeast Asia and East Asia, so they promoted India's soft power uh, in the soft power in international politics, or in the, they promote there were the elements of soft power in India's, um, which which promoted the idea of India uh, in the international system. Uh, there are certain, but uh, now coming back to the third aspect again, that there are certain weaknesses of soft power. Uh, soft power. Uh, uh, power is credible only when it is backed by the hard power. Uh, if soft power is not supported by the hard power, uh, the, the, the other countries will take it as a sign of weakness. Uh, if the soft power is backed by the hard power, as this is done by the countries like United States or, 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 or uh, France or Germany or United Kingdom, so they are uh, backed by the real hard power in terms of economic power and the military power. So uh, soft power is not an alternative to the hard power. So it's the combination which matters, and, the, and they help each other in promoting. Uh, in the promoting, in the soft power would promote the idea of hard power, and hard power will also promote the idea of soft power. So they have a very reciprocal kind of relationship, and that plays a role in uh, creating the, what, what uh, Joseph Nye would call the smart power. And the cultural superpowers, India, uh, as uh, we say that you know India is a cultural superpower, but cultural superpowers are not enough to win the war. And as you know that you know India had, a, India had a huge uh, uh, this uh, uh, huge uh, capital of soft power uh, even in 1950s and 60s, but that did not help India win the war against China. So you have to have the hard power uh, in, in support of the soft power because you cannot completely bank. Uh, just on the so soft power. So these are some of the weaknesses and that one has to, when making the policy, one state has to take into this account. 
uh, the, what are the threats to Indian soft power? Because we discussed about the Indian soft power, but the, the, the certain threats which are damaging the image of India in the international system. One is the growing uh, religious intolerance. Uh, as I told you, there are some of the uh, minority institutions were attacked. Uh, so any attack on minority is taken as a, as a sign of you know, the weakness of soft power and that is criticized and that is challenged by the other states. So any attack on Islam in India would be taken as an attack uh, on, um, on, on uh, it would be criticized in the Islamic State. Uh, similarly, any attack on Christian, Christianity would be criticized by, uh, by the Christian countries uh, in the West. Rise of majoritarianism where the, the minorities are discriminated. So that again is something uh, which is uh, not uh, liked by, uh, which, is, which is damaging the image of uh, India in the international system. Uh, now, and then there are certain social divisions. For instance, you know, the Indian society uh, is uh, is uh, divided on the caste lines, uh, and there is uh, an Indian society is also where uh, you have a certain group of people who are very rich, but there are people who are completely left out from the system. So there is a poverty, uh, there, there is a huge unemployment. So that is not giving a very positive image of India. If you see the um, a, a film like you know the Slum Dog Millionaire which could have otherwise promoted the, the Indian culture or which could have promoted the image of India in the, in the West or United States. The, but you know, what, it, uh, what it projects is that, that you know, uh, there is a, there's a poverty, uh, there is a kind of you know, the, there is a filth and poverty in India which is uh, spread uh, in most of the parts of India. So that, that gives a very negative image of India and uh, uh, the disparity that we have, the poverty that we have. In fact, poverty has become the poverty of India has become the selling point for for the Western uh, for the Western media and also for the Western movies, Western Hollywood films. Uh, many of the many of the many of the, the many of the films of the of, of Hollywood they, they in, in the initial years uh, they they projected India as the the country of the snake charmers or the country of the elephant. Uh, you have the if you have seen the. Uh, Indiana Jones series of uh, the Hollywood movies, Indiana Jones. So uh, they uh, projected India as the country of the snake charmer or the country of the of the king, uh, the, uh, king and uh, the the country where, where the elephants are there, the country where the the cows and the bulls are walking on the street. So that is uh, uh, giving a very negative uh, image of India in the in the Western countries. So that you know that uh, unless until India also developed in terms of. Uh, uh, or India kind of bridges the gap which is there between the, between the people who are, who are left out uh, from the mainstream. So that uh, gives a very bad image of India as you know the, the growing religious intolerance and the, the discrimination of any group or the social minorities or the linguistic minority. So that creates a very negative image of India uh, in the outside world. So uh, uh, the, in, in the recent years the secular uh, plural and democratic culture of India has also been uh, has come under criticism because they argue that you know the secular fabric of India is now being challenged because of because of the the, ro the growing role of religion in, in in Indian politics, the growing role of uh, the caste in Indian politics. So that is uh, again giving a very negative of image of India in the eyes of uh, in the eyes of uh, uh, the in the eyes of uh, the in, uh, the Western scholars or the Western people. But there are certain uh, certain criticisms against the soft power. I mean, the people have argued that uh, the that is not uh, is uh, soft power in itself is not very effective uh, effective uh, element of power because you know uh, the what finally matters is hard power. So you know uh, the people argue the scholars argue that one should focus on the hard power rather than uh, rather than the soft power. So uh, one of the criticism is that you know this. Uh, uh, the soft power is not very effective. The second is that you know, second second kind of criticism which has come is that you know, it's difficult to distinguish between the hard power and the soft power because you know, if one is so embedded with the other, one is so linked to the other, and uh, it's very difficult to distinguish what is hard power and what is soft power. For instance, you know, uh, uh, the the trade and the McDonald's and the expansion of M multinational companies, they are sometimes explained as an uh, element of uh, hard power, but you know they are also promoting the soft power. So the distinction, the the the, the, the distinction, uh, uniqueness of soft power cannot be explained very easily. And how they influence the foreign policy, that again is uh, questioned by the scholars. That uh, that uh, the countries which are promoting hard power by whether by design or by 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 you know. Uh, uh, inadvertently, they are also promoting the soft power. So, the distinguishing the hard power with the soft power, that is another difficulty which is uh, faced by the scholars uh, in international politics. 
now again some of the people and the criticism this criticism has come primarily from uh, this uh, liberal scholar uh, pr primarily from the marxist scholars that you know uh, they argue that soft power is associated with uh, globalization and is associated with the neoliberal forms of uh, international system well in the neoliberal system what you promoting is basically the idea of capital uh, so what you promote is capitalism where the third world the third world countries or the emerging the developing countries they are seen as the market for the developed states and they supply uh, they supply uh, this uh, uh, the, the the finished products to these uh, third world states and uh, through that you know they uh, they capture the market and they capture the uh, they capture the the resources from of the poor states and the poor states you know behave like periphery and the, the core states uh, which are the major beneficiary of the uh, hard power and the soft power and uh, pe people have also criticized that you know hard power is basically uh, soft power is basically complementing the concept of uh, uh, the concept of hard power and many times you know the scholars have used the notion of soft power uh, to basically substantiate or they use it as an alibi or justification uh, for the for the for the for the hard power uh, they give they give the example of uh, uh, the us role for instance the, the role of united states in countries like iraq and afghanistan where uh, the us used the justification of promotion of democracy so promotion of democracy uh, basically you know they argued that you know us wanted to control the oil and gas from uh, iraq so as a result they attacked iraq and they uh, they uh, they uh, they sold the idea they sold the, the notion of soft power that you know they are trying to promote democracy in these states but the basic idea the basic notion the reason they promoted uh, this uh, uh, soft power was to capture the resources of iraq and they wanted to basically it was an idea it was it was it was basically intended to uh, to capture the resources of the state uh, for the benefit of uh, the american state uh, as a result which which finally you know and that that capturing for that to justify that as an alibi they, they argue that this basically they were trying to promote the democracy now uh, as you can see that iraq is neither a democracy nor uh, an a stable a stable state uh, what has happened what has happened in iraq is basically iraq has become uh, uh, now is un, un, under the influence of isis as you know and uh, that is a very powerful uh, powerful uh, fundamentalist islamic force and that has taken control of many parts of the parts of iraq and iraq is a very destabilized state now so there is no chance of democracy uh, coming to that state in uh, in some in near future similarly in afghanistan uh, you know they uh, they try to uh, they try to uh, control or they, they argued that you know they would convert the united states and the nato forces they argued that they'll convert afghanistan into a democracy but finally what we see in afghanistan is a completely destabilized state where taliban are uh, even now taliban are very powerful and taliban are being supported by a country like pakistan and pakistan is getting uh, aid uh, or uh, getting aid or the financial support from country like united states so there is a very vicious kind of nexus which is there between the american hard power and what they call the soft power but the but the idea you know uh, my my purpose to explain you the concept of soft power is just to uh, to familiar uh, to make you familiar with the idea of soft power then you can develop your own critique that whether you like the notion of soft power or not uh, please understand the soft power is not uh, completely detached from the hard power and because many of the elements that you see the and many of the elements of soft power they are basically some kind of extensions of soft power but there are certain value system certain uh, uh, for instance you know the idea of democracy the idea of say uh, the, some of the philosophy culture cuisine uh, the films uh, so these are the broader elements of soft power which cannot be uh, explained just if you explain uh, the just the elements of hard power so while explaining a foreign policy of a country uh, you can uh, you can you can you can actually think of uh, the 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 two distinctions that you have hard power and the soft power that might help you in understand the 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 elements of foreign policy of a state and you, you can also analyze on the foreign policy of any state in terms of hard power of that state and also the soft power of soft power of that state so with this i come to the uh, conclusion of my presentation i hope you liked it uh, thank you so much thank you so much sir for this uh, presentation of yours and we are of course very privileged that you have come over to our studio and uh, delivered a lecture here and uh, with this uh, friends of course i'd like to tell you that there's more to follow we have another lecture uh, lined up by sir tomorrow and uh, with this we take your leave uh, but of course you must again thanks sir thank you so much sir again thank you roshi thank you and so much and thank you friends for watching have a great day